Any guess? 150, 175, 80. Uh, this thing, believe it or not, it was aged quite accurately by the U.S. Forest Service, uh, just by counting rings, but uh, it's 352 years old, and it was cut at three feet, and this was cut from a plot that Doug uh, started up in San Luis Obispo County. There's also one on, on the Sierra Foothill Station, and uh, probably unusual, though, to have a tree, a blue oak, this old. It was a poor site, grew very slowly, obviously. It's only about 13 inches in diameter. Uh, so again, this also, I'd like to thank the station, though, before I forget, for inviting me uh, today. Uh, it's a beautiful and, and useful station, to say the least, especially this time of the year. Uh, that gets into this. This is probably an exception. This is not from this area, and it's not from San Luis Obispo County, it's from Tulare County, but it's probably not too far from what you have here. It's probably not too much of a stretch. 95% of the blue oak trees are less than 150, uh, 150 years old. It's the exception that falls in here. About a quarter are in this area, and about a quarter are 1 to, one to 50 years old. Uh, with that, I'll start, maybe Doug can flip that, it's got a clip on. Where was that? You know, I don't know. Um, it could have been Mitch McLaren. I think it would have been the Tehachapis. Probably the, what's that big place that just got subdivided? Yeah, Cajon Ranch. Probably Cajon Ranch from the Tehachapis. Probably. What I'd like to do for a couple of minutes is talk about, I asked Doug, hey, you know, what, what should I talk about up there? And he said, well, try to mention some things uh, that they can do or not do that will screw things up uh, as far as habitat. So I'm going to try to hit on some of that. <laughs> and uh, I'll start by talking about elements, habitat elements, uh, which are really the components of habitat. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about dense versus thick uh, oak woodland. And I'll end with, I understand that. What is the composition here? How many of you are ranchers? Would you classify yourselves? How about urban, you know, in-city type? How about ranchette? Yeah. Okay, I know there's a few of uh, a few of them around. Okay. What to do not to screw things up? First of all, what are habitat elements? I think there's about 140 different ones, such as rock outcrops and, and so forth and so forth that the California Fish and Game has identified. I just identified here some of the, probably the, I don't know, the main ones perhaps. Acorns, snags, cavities, coarse wood, logs, in other words, uh, riparian areas, very important, shrubs. There's some detail in these columns, don't be concerned with that. But I just wanted to point out which of these are probably the most important. I'm really trying to talk today about habitat or wildlife diversity. It's a big buzzword. Sustainability, <coughs> biodiversity. What do you need to maintain diversity under different conditions, different uh, levels of development and, and so forth? Well, if you're going to try to maintain diversity, it's important to try to keep some of these things. And you can see here the ones that could re should really focus on shrubs, <coughs> shrubs in riparian areas to keep uh, wildlife diversity. Uh, and native shrubs. If there's one buzzword that I'd like you to keep in mind or maybe take away from our little discussion here, it would be structure. And uh, uh, Scott is, is still here. Structure, I think Scott would agree with, in the right places uh, is, is certainly useful. So we're talking about structure at the landscape level and we're talking about structure at what I'll call the stand level. Oak woodland is really a matrix, a matrix of chaparral, and you can see that if you look out there. Grassy areas and treed areas. And at the landscape level, as far as wildlife are concerned, that matrix, the composition of the matrix, or the habitat quality within the different patches of grass or trees or chaparral, the quality of the habitat between the patches the distances between the patches, the size of the patches, and the connectivity among the patches all has incredible effects 
on what kind and how many uh, wildlife that you have. So that's about all I'm going to say about matrix or structure at the landscape level. Now I'm going to focus on more the stand level and specifically the wood wooded stand. And you know we can use Doug's little uh, homegrown forest here uh, for our stand. And like I said, structure is important at the stand level too. And by structure at the stand level, I'm talking about vertical structure as opposed to horizontal structure in the landscape. Wildlife like to have stuff on the ground. And this gets back to our elements here, coarse wood, logs, and so forth. A middle layer of shrubs and these smaller trees certainly uh, can function as shrubs when they're about this size. Also toyon, manzanita, coffee berry, and then the canopy layer. If you have those three layers well represented, you're going to have more critters uh, than, and, and good critters, uh, most people would, would agree, more biodiversity than if you have, for example, that, or if, you, if the shrub layer. Uh, is missing, or one of the other layers is, is pretty much missing. And that's because, guess what? Certain species of wildlife, uh, uh, some of the birds live just in this shrub layer. They make pretty much their whole living in coffee berry toyon. Same for the canopy layer, foliage, gleaners, and, uh, well, different critters, of course, on, on the ground. So the more of those layers and the better developed that they are, the better off you're going to be. Now, you know, if you live in on ranch shed or in an urban area, you're not going to create something like that, chances are. But think about, are there any of these that you can have? Or can you plant a tree? Or, or just, you know, what can be done to help this along a little bit and that you can live with? Uh, as far as studies that have been done, been done on the range uh, here, the, the field station relating to diversity, uh, Morrison and Block did a pretty extensive study here in the late 1980s, early 1990s. They found that there were 114 species of birds. Uh, of those, about 60 were breeding birds. Um, they found, uh, Tart mentioned these this morning too, uh, 15 or 16 different amphibians and reptiles. I think there were about 7 to 10 different species of small mammals. So certainly this is a, a great habitat. Uh, the structure is, you know, out of the rangeland is, is uh, very well represented, both at the horizontal and at the, the stand levels. Another study I wanted to mention that they did that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, I was a little bit later, a guy by the name of Agner, working, who was a student of Morrison, who was a professor at Berkeley, did a firewood cutting study where they removed, I don't know exactly where that was on the range. Um, Nobody's here, and I'm not sure where it was. The, the work on that, I don't And that's not really important yeah. now, but they removed, at the, when, let's say, the, fire, the hardwood program started in the, in the 19, you know, 1986, and at that time, especially in Northern California, this, this area, uh, Shasta and Tehama County, firewood cutting was a, a big issue. It's, it's not so much anymore. Uh, people don't seem to do that as much as they used to, but cut firewood for home use or for commercial purposes. And so they did an experiment uh, in that they removed about a quarter of the blue oak trees uh, on, uh, I think it was 30 plots, and then they had 30 other plots that they used as controls. They left a lot of these elements they didn't remove, I don't think the, first of all, I don't think the field station wanted them to remove any more than a quarter of the trees. It was actually a quarter, 23% of the basal area. And uh, they wanted them to keep these habitat elements. They also made brush piles out of some of the, the limbs and so forth from the cut trees. Uh, but they found that generally the critters after the removal did pretty good. Uh, they, they looked at specifically birds. Uh, those, a couple of them, such as a Pacific slow pipe catcher that were really sensitive, Hunton's Vireo, to uh, tree density, canopy cover, declined, uh, but also some of them increased, some others increased. Uh, so their conclusion was pretty much, if you keep these as 
pretty well intact, you're probably not going to destroy things too badly as far as the wildlife are concerned uh, by some fairly moderate thinning. So, Another? we're going to go on yep. here. So okay. Any questions or comments as we go along? In the study, did they relate the structure to the Did they relate the study to you're the structure? About, you're talking about the structure of the shrubs and the debris. Right, right. Did they, did they quantify that and relate it to where they were finding what species? They did from the standpoint, probably not to the detail that you might be thinking about. They did it as far as that they just kept those elements, the, the shrubs and the downwood, and they actually made more structure in a way by creating piles and so forth. But, but did they record where the birds were? Or they, yeah. the, the birds were in terms of in the top of the canopy or in the mid canopy? Or uh, I am sure I don't think they reported that data. They did, but uh, just in reading their paper. So I guess I can't answer that uh, completely. But suffice it to say that they certainly concluded that those things were important. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the next dense versus sparse habitat. Well, that up there is certainly very sparse as far as we're talking about these habitat elements now. Uh, that was experimentally removed to look at water yield and so forth in the 1960s, I believe. That's fairly sparse. Dense up there, even though you, it's kind of hard to tell, that certainly is very dense. This, this is dense, but it's not exactly what I'm referring to as a dense woodland. Dense woodland I'm talking about, again, a lot of development on the ground of forbs and downed wood and, and so forth. Different kinds of native shrubs, toyon, coffee berry, and then probably two or three different species of, of oak trees in the canopy. Dense is good for at least, again, this is terrestrial vertebrates, amphibians, mammals, reptiles, uh, and birds, winter birds in this case. Dense is good especially for these these guys, the amphibians, small mammals, uh, different kinds of, you know, the wood rats, the different, the five or six different, different kinds of mice. Uh, maybe not so important. Reptiles, fairly open area, uh, you know, grassy and uh, seem to generally do pretty well. And the birds, too, uh, don't seem to rely on, let's say, the dense habitat. Again, though, in, on your property, you're probably not going to create a lot of real dense habitat, but especially in a rangeland situation, if you can keep at least some patches of this denser stuff, it's going to really benefit your diversity. And probably, I think we learned this morning, that probably, you know, with patches of it and so forth, that can get along pretty well with the cattle. and. Uh, uh, things were do pretty, pretty well from a management perspective. Uh, something else I was going to say there, I, it, it slipped my mind. Um, so, with that, I wanted to point out some of the interdependencies. Doug said, "We'll talk about well, what shouldn't they do to, to screw things up?" Uh, you can screw up one of these things again. Talking about these habitat elements. And it kind of causes other things to get screwed up, too, so to speak. Uh, for example, look at the scrub jay. Uh, as far as having them and what they do, how that affects the well-being of the woodland. Work has been done on the scrub jays by this fellow that uh, uh, Doug mentioned uh, that was here on Wednesday, apparently. Walt Koenig, is that who you're talking mm -hmm. about? Worked a lot with uh, acorns. He's also worked a very lot with acorn woodpeckers. Uh, and and scrub jays, uh, work has also been done at, at the Hastings Reserve where, where Walt uh, has been. Uh, but the individual scrub jay caches in the ground, they found about 7,000 acorns a season or a year. And of course, they can't go back and retrieve all of them, so some of them come up and, and regrow uh, the trees. So they can be, uh, Grinnell called them uphill planters. Uh, where they move the acorns, of course, from the oak trees up the hill, and then you get more uh, oak trees up the, up the hill and so forth. Another uh, important interaction is the acorn woodpecker and uh, creating cavities. A lot of birds, there's a lot of birds in fairly open oak woodland because there tends to be more 
larger trees in the more open oak woodland. And the larger trees tend to have more cavities and a lot of, a pretty big percent of the, the birds in oak woodland are cavity nesting birds. Primary cavity nesting birds such as acorn woodpeckers that make the cavities and then secondary cavity nest, nesting birds that use the cavities that are abandoned by the primary cavity nesting birds when they're done with them. So a lot of interrelationships that you try to keep as many of the parts as you can uh, and if you take away one of them it can affect other ones uh, as well. So we'll That's turn our chart. Finally, uh, Doug said there'd probably be some ranchette owners here or people that live in the city. Uh, he was right. And so I wanted to mention something specific, specifically about ranchettes. And I think kind of in a nutshell, city uh, houses in the city, urban, uh, urban developments, uh, ranchettes, you tend to, for obvious reasons, have fewer natives, fewer native plants, uh, plant exotics, shrubs, exotic trees, those guys over there maybe, the eucalyptus, um, liquid amber. These exotics, of course, don't have the wildlife value that the natives do. The, the wildlife evolved with the native plants, and of course they do better. Uh, they make a living off of them uh, much better than they do off of the exotics. So what I've tried to show here is simply that in a ranch, or in a, this is, the cow represents the ranch, the rangeland, the horse, the ranchette and uh, the house, the, the more subdivision, urbanized area. Tree density, of course, is relatively high on the rangeland, lower in the ranchette, uh, and have more exotics, uh, vegetation in the ranchette. And so, in turn, you tend to have fewer uh, native birds in the, in the ranchette. Uh, area. You tend to get more um, uh, mockingbirds. Anybody have mockingbirds on your property? What do you do with them this time of the year? Well, you listen to them sing all night long. Yeah, you shoot them, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you live near a busy highway, then it's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the silver lining, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, what can you do? What would be the recommendation? Well, certainly structure best you can. Uh, getting back to Doug, plant a tree. When's the best time to plant a tree? It was 20 years ago, but if you didn't do that, <laughs> plant it this weekend. And uh, you can see here that they can grow fairly rapidly. And there's some beautiful oaks that make, you know, good, I think good urban trees, valley oaks grow fairly rapidly. But there's an island oak, uh, uh, Tomentella. Uh, native to the islands, but I planted them on my property in town, and they seem to do pretty well. They have beautiful, glossy oak leaves that are available in nurseries. So uh, try to do one thing, one little thing, and it can go a long ways to uh, promoting diversity and probably making your property really more beautiful than it is even. To your yes? point on structure, um, first, I don't know if manzanita are uh, native or uh, introduced, but if I wanted to, because of the fuel uh, contained in manzanita, if I wanted to reduce the f manzanita, what would you recommend as to replace that element in the structure? With what another, you're thinking of manzanita as being a shrub? I am. Yeah, I would. Not. And you'd want to remove it just because you don't like it or because of fuel? Because of the fire, fire concern? I, I, it seems to burn. Well, I don't know. Maybe Scott can help me out here. In fact, I was going to ask him when he was talking this morning, are there any native shrubs such, such as coffee berry or toyon that are much less flammable that perhaps you know, they would certainly serve the wildlife function? I mean, from the manzanita point of view, we have no problem with uh, with small, small stands, you know, individual plants and small stands. I'd almost think from a biological point of view, it it would normally have a life cycle that wouldn't be a, a 50 year life cycle that had 90% dead wood and 10% 10, 10 live wood. Uh, 
you know, by, by thinning those stands out, and once they get to a certain age, letting letting smaller ones come up. I mean, it's the live manzanita isn't near the fire threat that the dead wood in it is. So, and I was wrong. It is, I mean, it is a threat, and it, it causes spot fires, but those healthy, healthy young live plants do a much better do a much better job in fire than the old dead stuff does. I to lift my manzanita. On uh, the San Luis Obispo Fire Council, there is somebody that uh, on the council that is looking into, you know, the, the, the distance and are there natives that maybe wouldn't substantially increase the fire. And Cal, Cal Fire, fire has so those uh, uh, native uh, fire resistant plants on their website, as do most of the uh, extension, cooperative extension offices. I've, I've seen those lists before. Well, Manzanita is a native, but it, it, it yeah. tolerates that very dry band of elevation that virtually nothing else will grow in. And, uh, you know, you can maybe get some Cianosis to grow at those elevations, but the deer just love it, so you can't get it to grow anyway. So, I mean, the answer to replacement of Manzanita in some of our minds is uh, bare mineral soil. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help, sir, at all? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Up, up in our area, we're, at Tahoe, where Manzanita doesn't grow all that high, the fire people are recommending uh, four foot wide or wider breaks cut through Manzanita stands just to you know, leave islands that separate so there's less likelihood of, of transference of the fire through the stand. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, wait, Bill, I have a question. What do you do with uh, down snags? What, what's your recommendation for wildlife on down snags, down trees? Would you leave some? Well, I, I'd, I'd leave them all if you can. A lot of, lot of wildlife value. Okay. Uh, a lot, you know, amphibians, reptiles, insects, uh, you name it, small mammals, even birds nest along the quail, for example, along the side. So if you can leave it, do that. In some cases you can't, it might be a fire hazard, uh, but I think a lot of, particularly uh, ranchers and other people going way back, you of course don't do that, but if they remove them, they don't look nice, uh, it's just sort of the thing to do to clean things mm -hmm. up, uh, or they're a fire hazard, which is certainly can be legitimate, but leave it if you can, for I sure. I have one more question. Yes. We're down on the valley floor, and of course the valley floor has been mostly cleared completely, it's all orchards and such. How do you even know what was there once? <laughs> you know, I mean, yes, there are valley oak and things like that, but it, it's very hard to find any places that are undisturbed or were. You know, and everything. you're asking, and, is there any literature right. or anything that really reports historically? Fremont, uh, I'm not sure where Fremont that comes from. Fremont has good uh, journals going up the east side of the feather. There was somebody called Brewer rode up and down California. I understand yeah. that and that's Ripley's another. Maps. Basically, yeah. you're looking at, at dry upland. They marked the water holes. It was dry, dead grass with a, kind of a blue oak savanna. Right. Was, once you got up 10 feet above the valley floor and valley oaks down there in the flats. But there aren't good records. It's a problem. I mean, it's no aerial photographs from the 1600s. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! I, I don't know. What, what are the Eastlander? Were they the 40s? Not as far 30s, back as... 33 or something. We have great aerial photos from 37 that are being used uh, to hammer ranchers nowadays as saying, this is what you've destroyed, even though the government uh, paid you to do it. So. <laughs> hey, we taught right. you how to do it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, if anybody would know, I would think it would be uh, <laughs> Keeley. Frank Healy, is he at... Uh, He's in the pen. Uh, is he in the, and Minich have looked at those, that sort of... Uh, they're fire ecologists, and I, I would guess that they would at least be aware of anything that would be out there. If you want to give me an address or whatever, I could try to get contact information for them. But you got to give it to me today. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just a quickie, is there any wisdom on redirecting the energies of acorn woodpeckers? <laughs> <laughs> using the they can be a problem. They can be a problem, the can't they? Not having bad slickers, though. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I know of is netting. You're talking about them drilling in houses. 
your house. Your house. <laughs> uh, shooting doesn't do too much good. It's against the law, but also there are floaters. They live in groups, acorn woodpeckers, and there's floaters that are extra of the population. If one is removed from a, a group of 10 or 15, then the floater fills in the spot. Uh, it's also very against the law. But uh, netting is, is about the only thing that I'm, a, I'm aware of. Big cat. What? Big cat. Come and jump high. The what? I'm sorry. I, had a, I said a big cat. A big cat? Yeah, probably. I had probably, like, yeah, probably. Like that would, I suppose that would work. Every day I heard it take it out. On Wednesday, Walt Kernig suggested to me uh, aluminum siding. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard if you have wood already, it's hard to do that. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, but that's a that's a tough one. But if you can, if the woodpeckers, if you can teach them to behave, uh, you can have a big valley oak in your yard where there's all kinds of... But I forgot to say, before I'm done here, the best thing of all, if I have to leave a... a, 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 a the final take-home message is, and this one comes from my wife who likes to garden and uh, raise different food plants and, and so forth. She told me on the way up here, uh, this trip she happens to be with me, she said, tell them if you want to have birds, plant strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come and eat them. Yeah, because you want to have strawberries.